so it was one way valve. You know, right near All righty, let's get started on the uh, workshop tonight. So we'll start off this evening with a uh, presentation on zoning, zoning by Kelly. I can thank you very much. Um, I'll try to make this pretty brief, as brief as you can for something as exciting as zoning. But since we all touch on zone, I, I look at it every day, and you all are occasionally asked to do that as part of the Planning Commission or the Board of Commissioners. But I um, wanted to let you know some of the things that we've noticed uh, in, in doing our jobs that there is a, um, seems to be a mismatch in some zoning uh, categories that we have and then and some, some missing areas and some areas for opportunity. So I <coughs> wanted to, to share, you, uh, share with you some of the things that we've uh, uh, discovered and some of the conversations we've had. And the boring part first, um, or the less boring part first, um, <clears throat> as you all probably know, communities that have a zoning ordinance, um, every property in the city is, is, has to be assigned a zoning district if you have a zoning ordinance in your city or county. Um, <clears throat> and that's, of course, called the zoning ordinance. So if, you, if somebody changes their property um, that uh, or property zoning, that in effect is changing the law every time that happens because it, it's said in at one point when the zoning ordinance is adopted and these are all amendments. So in fact, you're, you are changing the um, ordinance. So rezoning can be initiated by the property owner themselves, which is most common, um, or by local government. 
uh, the city can uh, rezone property after a, a duly commissioned uh, zoning study for looking at conditions and, and that sort of thing. Um, in my tenure here, we've done that once uh, on Main Street, and that was uh, after some annexation and some, some concerns that the residents had, and the city did um, look into it and, and make some zoning changes um, that the city initiated after com uh, comments from the uh, public and the property owners. So whatever the case, the rationale for changing the zone, since it is changing the, uh, changing the uh, law, it should be expressed clearly um, and should be weighed carefully in terms of impact on the property owner and then those uh, are nearby. And then if it's detrimental to the city as a whole. So, you know, this is almost a quick zoning 101. So what is hot and what's not hot in the current market? And by that, I mean zoning and zoning and apparent zoning demand. Um, well, aside from the McKee Foods plant, uh, at plant five expansion, uh, residential construction permitting, even with supply chain issues, has consistently outpaced commercial industrial development in the last two years. So if you take the McKee expansion out just as far as dollar investment, um, I would say that's you've seen that also, Andrew, that was some some of your data uh, from the building permits that you that you issue from your side. So <clears throat> this is uh, per, per dollar value and just sheer volume. This is sort of a uh, a a. a completely flip-flop from what we've typically seen in the past. We're seeing a lot of demand for single-family detached homes and townhouses. And then, of course, as we've seen uh, in the past, multifamily dwellings, apartments. We get a lot of phone calls for these. Um, however, the, uh, the appropriate zoning is not always, um, I guess, it's not always available or hasn't. It would have to be rezoned. And so a lot of folks um, have asked us about that. When they see R3 on the map, they want to know a little more about it, and we have to kind of fill them in on some of the peculiarities of some of the R3 zoning, and R3 allows multifamily um, dwellings currently. So <clears throat> is this a problem that we've seen uh, this sort of flip from, from one sense of source of demand to another? Um, I'm just going to say possibly, and I'm just bringing this up for your uh, information, $259,900. So $260,000, what is that? That's the 2020 median home sales price in Hamilton County, all of Hamilton County. Uh, 343,000, and these are 2020 numbers closed out of 2020. We've seen this continue through 2021. Uh, that's the median home sales price in roughly in the College Dale Udwa area. So <clears throat> as you can see, we do have a higher median home sales price in um, our area. We've had those discussions, I know, for, for other reasons. So. We do think that a scarcity of available and developable residential land will be an ongoing factor, uh, particularly considering that the city's footprint is not expected to significantly expand in the next decade. Uh, that would only be through annexation, and that would be through owner-requested annexation, which is not um, out of the question, but it is much less common, and uh, so that is the realm that we will operate in. Um, we're seeing an influx of newcomers to Hamilton County. This is Collegedale is not immune to or is not shielded from or, or from the local market, the overall market forces. And what we're seeing is this influx of newcomers into the uh, area, putting upward pressure on home values uh, amid a tight supply. Uh, supply chain issues with construct, new construction, uh, putting that aside, we're still seeing a, an increase in demand. So we're having a supply problem and a, an increased demand. So um, just wanted to bring that to your attention to kind of shape as our conversation here. Um, so to kind of bring this back, back around to some of our earlier conversations, um, but not that long ago, we were talking about retail and commercial development uh, was a, should be a, a, a focus. And, and it, in fact, it has been uh, until we started seeing some changes in the market. And like I said, we're, all, we're uh, seeing changes in, in market forces just like the rest of the country is. So what has happened? Um, previous expectations have uh, been dampered, I suppose. COVID-19, acceleration of uh, online commerce, remote work options are more available, and shifting consumer preferences. Consumer preferences. Um, in fact, here's a, a, a something that I think is pretty amazing. Online retail sales increased 32.4% year over year in 2020 
And in first quarter of 2021, they were already at 39% year over year. That's astounding because the online, the volume of online sales has already been met um, and exceeded uh, that was originally expected to take eight to 10 years to absorb. So we, when I say we as a nation, uh, really this is a world phenomenon that in, in uh, consumer economies, um, the online uh, has completely changed the game as far as retail. Um, here's a couple of examples of larger mega trends, if you will. Uh, boomers, the generation born between roughly 1946 and 1964, uh, they're consuming less in retirement as expenditures shift from material goods to healthcare and experiences. So this is less consumer uh, money or less uh, money in the uh, consumer economy. Also, younger generations are willing to spend more disposable income on experiences rather than just simply material goods, or they want an experience with their their retail uh, brick and mortar experience. So that's why you have some of these destination shopping areas. And so aside from that, those are some, kind of the two mega trends that are affecting the retail market in addition to a shift to online commerce. So what does this mean for the city? <clears throat> potentially less in-person impulse shopping by customers from outside the city. Um, what does that mean? What we're seeing fewer, we could see fewer imported dollars uh, left behind in the local economy. So somebody stops in uh, at a retailer here, Walmart, uh, and then they go to a shop next door, they spend some money, and then they take all those goods back somewhere else outside of the city. That's what, that's the traditional model, uh, along with city residents. Um, so with a shift to online sales, um, now this is where it gets a little interesting because it's based on the point of delivery. So if you order that same item from somewhere, online commerce, Amazon's the one that everybody points to, but there's more than just Amazon, um, it's taxed on the point of delivery. So if you are living in Appison outside the city limits and you order something that you could have picked up in person at a store here, then at that point, um, the taxes would not accrue to the city. So that gets a potential loss of revenue source there. Um, <clears throat> so weren't we discussing zoning? Yes, we were. So let's look at some of the commercial zoning that w the city now, uh, th now th these are actual numbers as of today, uh, around 1,283 acres of land in the city, um, well, allow commercial uses. Only 36% of this is even being used for commercial purposes. So just barely a third, barely over a third of what we've zoned commercially is being used for commercial purposes. So what's going on here? Based on overly optimistic assumptions based on a different model, uh, retail and commercial demand uh, has shifted as we've discussed. And previously, many properties were preemptively zoned commercial upon annexation, particularly on Apson Pike, Little Debbie Parkway, and the eastern portions of Lee Highway. And <clears throat> And that was based on the assumption that um, the commercial demand would fulfill, uh, would be able to fill the, uh, the, the commercial zoning there. And as we see, you know, we're 10 years on from just about from a lot of this, and it hasn't happened. Um, there are vacancies, commercial vacancies in a lot of the surrounding areas, both in and outside of the Collegedale retail market, which does extend outside of the city boundary. So... <clears throat> That is something that we're seeing right now that I want to bring to your attention. Also, industrial zoning, uh, manufacturing and warehousing, they're often included in the same category. Uh, and in fact, our zoning code and most others uh, tend to treat the two similarly. Um, both are important components of the local economy. However, the economic impact of value-added manufacturing tends to be greater. Um, and the key revenues generated by these activities include property and excise taxes. And Michelle, you have the full list of how that can, can contribute to the economy. I'm just hitting the high points here. Um, daytime population figures due to employees being in the city in addition to residents, keep in mind that some folks are leaving the city to go to work and some are coming in to go to work. And so when everybody, all, all the dust settles and everybody's gotten where they um, earn their paycheck, um, we're going to see that. Uh, income earned in Collegedale isn't always spent in Collegedale. For example, um, Collegedale's estimated residential population is 12,164, but daytime population is 14,269. So 
a net increase of uh, 2,100 uh, workers who commute into the city. And so what I'm saying is that it's difficult to quantify how much of their earned income in Collegedale is left behind in Collegedale through going out for lunch, buying dinner, picking up something at the grocery store. Um, I will say manufacturing jobs tend to be much more limited. Uh, workers in, in their ability to take an hour's lunch or 30 minute lunch and leave the premises, eat something, then come back because things are on such a timetable um, and it's on a set time. So it's very difficult to, to quantify how much, um, say, lunch business somebody would do just based on the employees. <clears throat> um, and as another fact, and I probably could have put this one a little bit earlier, but of those uh, workers in Collegedale, around 56% are employed in manufacturing. And of course, we you know, ha are fortunate to have a very large manufacturer, one of the county's largest manufacturers headquartered in here with a lot of facilities. Plus, we're on the doorstep of Enterprise South with uh, 10,000 plus uh, employees over there. But in Collegedale itself, city limits, about 56% uh, of uh, Collegedale's industrial workers are employed in manufacturing. And there are other smaller manufacturers too, which contribute to this uh, total of 56%. So <clears throat> back to zoning, about 645 acres of land in the city zoned industrial. Uh, for reference, that's about 9% of the total land area in the city. And that's a reasonable amount uh, within the city itself. And it's generally located away from the city center, uh, legacy zoning, where you'll have some little spots that, that were zoned years ago for um, industrial uh, user, users that may or may not still be present or may not be using all of that property today, um, or they're located in purpose-built industrial parks. Uh, successful cities feature a balance of land uses, including key industrial employers. So as I said earlier, we're very fortunate to have a very strong industrial component, but employees have to have a place to live. So let's look at our residential numbers. Around uh, 2,100 acres of land in the city's zone residential or would allow residential uses, uh, which is about 28% of the total land area in the city, uh, which on the outset, that, that's pretty impressive, but it's very misleading. Um, I, I would say more than somewhat. It's very misleading since a significant portion of that land is not developable uh, due to topography, uh, floodway, floodplains, um, um, or owner preference. We have a lot of property that is protected from development by the property owners, and that is through their, their choice. So uh, that property is perpetually uh, maintained as, as green space, which is also a very valuable component, which is beyond what we'll talk about today. So <clears throat> all these ingredients go together uh, to create our city form. So what about city form? Uh, one of the first things, if you just let things be and, and, and see what the market produces, uh, roadway uh, redesign can greatly improve uh, capacity, mobility, and safety. And roadway design is shaped by local policy, local land use and zoning, TDOT. Um, and what is the goal when a road is redesigned? So a lot of times what we'll see is there's a, uh, an interrelationship between uh, transportation and land use. So as we talked about zoning is how the adopted ordinance um, a zoning ordinance describes how the property can be used and controls that. And the land, actual land use describes how it's, it seems right there, the British say it does what it says on the tin. That describes how a property is actually being used. <clears throat> Transportation form is shaped by the land uses it serves in, in some cases. Um, in turn, transportation infrastructure may then uh, shape the adjacent land uses which in turn leads to a classic scenario that we've seen here. It may lead to speculative rezoning requests in order to change land uses. Um, the city has seen a lot of this. The city has also contributed to this. Um, years ago when Little Debbie Parkway was annexed, I've, I've researched some of this uh, in parts of Appleton and Pike. Uh, the idea was that if you preemptively zone it commercial, it shows you're ready for business. Um, I beg to differ looking at some of these numbers. So <clears throat> perception is strong and first impressions last. This of course is Appleton Pike looking west, <coughs> back toward Patton Town Road. As you can see, we have 
familiar five lane section here with a center turn lane, also known as the suicide lane because of the uh, its, uh, contributions to accidents in some studies. Um, and if you also see on either side of the road, the road has been open, I believe, fully open since uh, 2017. Uh, this phase two has, um, and this is a uh, Google image, street image from just two years ago, and it looks virtually the same today. You'll notice there's vacant land on both sides of the road. Um, this is property that was zoned commercial um, ahead of the roadway expansion, and to date it has not realized the commercial potential of the zoning that the city graciously gave the, the property uh, at the time. And you'll find this narrative also coming from um, other players, other entities, when a road is built, sometimes the appraisers, when they come into town, the people are a little leery about eminent domain or being, you know, having property purchased for a right of way. Um, oftentimes the appraisers will say, oh, you, you, you can zone this commercial and you'll make all your money back or you'll make you. And um, so th this is a common theme that has not played out yet, um, even in the face of these changing demands. So, well, that's kind of what we have now. So what's missing? Um, it's what we call in the, the planning world, this is one of the terms that's frequently used, is missing middle housing. Uh, is a range of house scale buildings, multiple units, compatible scale. Um, this is just a broad uh, <coughs> definition of that. But as staff, what we're seeing is a lot of questions, a lot of uh, inquiries about this middle density, it's not high density apartments, it's not single family detached necessarily, but it fits in the middle there. It would be more like row houses, fee simple townhouses where the property owner owns the building and, you know, or the, their unit and the property underneath. I mean, it's treated um, uh, that way in, legally. So, uh, you know, it's condominiums are another form of, of that. I mean, a townhouse may or may not be a condominium, but, um, <clears throat> We're seeing a lot of interest in this type of use, even though the, the developers haven't necessarily articulated this with to us or what they're looking for. Um, and they're still kind of uh, feeling their way through this. And interestingly, some of the questions that we've received or that we uh, fielded, uh, you know, or some of the individuals we fielded calls from are first and foremost have been commercial developers who are looking at other alternatives or they own property in the city that's zoned commercially but they have really come to this conclusion that that staff has and that i've played out here is that commercial is not going to be viable here this is not going to be a gun barrel road gun barrel road has its own issues this is not going to be gun barrel road this is not going to be the same thing um thank you for the c2 zoning but i can't do a thing with it is is essentially what we're hearing um which this came unsolicited to us. I mean, these were calls that we've received on top of our uh, staff conversations about seeing the same thing. Um, <clears throat> so what are some of the recommended things that we could do? Well, the market's shifting and continues to shift. Uh, so a new understanding of highest and best use is, is needed. Uh, reconsider certain corridors, starting with Appas and Pike, since it is uh, you know, one of the... Um, main entry points into the city uh take a look at the take a closer look at the glut of commercial zoning within the city um, and we're not talking about just Appas and pike but that's a, a a very good example of it little debbie parkway lee highway um i received a phone call today or at least i was forwarded a call about someone who would like to develop a residentially a, a residential use a, a single family home on the far ends of uh Lee Highway out toward Bradley County, McDonald, but the property was zoned C2 when it was annexed. So uh, normally that would be a very easy thing. Uh, yes, you know, subdivide it, you know, and you've got your lot. But no, you're going to have to have an extra step. You're probably going, you're, you are going to have to have that rezone because, believe it or not, 10 years later, no one has put a Walmart out there. No one has put a Target. No one has put a Lowe's, and, and I'm afraid they're not going to. So, but we have C2 zoning on vacant properties that are sitting fallow. So that happened today. Uh, so that was kind of good timing and just kind of fit in. We're seeing a lot of this lately. Uh, what else can we do? Consider how roadway design impacts property owners' expectations and development potential, uh, as we've discussed on Appleson Pike. Uh, fill in the gaps in the zoning ordinance so a broader range of housing forms can be utilized. Right now, 
Uh, some zoning ordinances range from far too complicated with far too many grades of uh, residential or commercial or what have you, and some are far too coarse, meaning it's you have about three flavors and that's it, chocolate, strawberry, vanilla, and you want a few other flavors to go in between there. That's more of where we are right now. And so uh, I'm recommending that we fill in the gaps in the zoning ordinance so a broader range of housing forms can be utilized. Right now, to build townhouses, you would need a planned unit development, which has to be five acres or greater, um, or you have to have an R3 rezoning and then condition out all the things that you don't want to take place in an R3, uh, which is a multifamily zone. So um, if you have a zone and the only way to get what you want or have a developer, the only way to get what they want is to condition 95% of the allowed uses out, there's a problem with the zone and, and a mismatch there. So those are pretty uh, straightforward, uh, I guess, uh, approaches that we can take. <clears throat> um, so the county, Hamilton County and city of Chattanooga and a couple of other of our peers already have an free, a freestanding, if you will, townhouse zone um, so that a property, it's a moderate density and it has those fee simple owner occupied or owner um, lots underneath them. And we don't have such a thing. Uh, that's the whole R3 problem I conundrum I just mentioned. So this is a, a fairly easy um, I, you know, approach and response to this is to allow that it would be fee simple owner occupied. Garden style rental apartments have utilized most of the property um, for you know, the multifamily uses right now. Uh, and which we think there, we have a, an, an overabundance of, of those types of uses at this point. So we need to diversify our housing um, type between single family detached, row houses, townhouses, and then the apartments that we already have. We're not proposing any additional garden style apartments that would require rezoning. And I'll give you the same information I tell everybody else that generally the commission has indicated to me, unless you all have changed, that that is not a, a direction that you're particularly interested in going. And until I know differently, that I've, that's the way I'm approaching that. Um, reconsider better and best locations for higher density residential development. Uh, physically sound development of this nature would be located near where the infrastructure is already present or would be easily extended. Um, so that's why we, you know, we, we already have a lot of that infrastructure in place in some of our corridors. Uh, such as Lee Highway and Appleton Pike. Um, selectively and strategically introduce more moderate density through new zoning approaches. Um, density is not always the issue. It's sometimes the form that it takes. Um, I can, I, I didn't, it's beyond our uh, kind of scope here, but I've seen uh, a number of examples of what would be for this area relatively high density, but it's in a beautiful building, it's beautifully executed. And then I've seen some that we can already probably think of our own that are that are not and the density is the same but the form is lacking so we but we do have tools to uh, help uh, push those developments in the right direction so that's a really quick run through i don't know if you have any questions but i'm available to um, uh, right now or if you have questions later you can send an email and i can send you some of the facts and figures here tonight so, anyway thank you very much Any questions? All right. So if not, we'll move on to the noise ordinance. Thank you, Kelly. <clears throat> that was supposed to be me, I guess, at like 10 or something. <laughs> yeah. hey, hey, hey. Thank you. <clears throat> it's over my head right now. <laughs> Kelly, can you email that to everybody? I will. <clears throat> I thought that would be the better way to do it. Yeah. So we have the noise ordinance. To, for discussion tonight. Um, I'm assuming everyone had a chance to read it after Jack sent it out last week. Um, I'm, a, I'm aware of two current situations that are kind of the focus of our conversation, <clears throat> one being the haunted house and the other is the commons. Uh, I'd like to talk about the commons first because we've initiated steps to address some of the things there. Uh, we've ordered some decibel meters and we'll be doing an, uh, some experiments at various locations at the Greenway and across the street. Uh, to see at, at what level of noise inside the the building is carrying how far. And from there, we will uh, generate some operational procedures 
on how events are handled there. Uh, that'll be outside of city ordinance. That will simply be operations that David and his group handle. Uh, along the <clears throat> closing doors at certain times, turning down the system <clears throat> and that sort of thing. Uh, the other would be the, the haunted house that's operated for as long as I can remember. I believe it actually started operation before coming into the city. Um, what we have done in the past is when we received a complaint, the police department would reach out to the owner and ask them to play nice, turn it down, that sort of thing, and try to gain compliance that way. Um, if, if we go down the road of enforcement, uh, we are facing, a, a, I think there's, what, eight or so nights a year that they actually have stuff on. It, it's the whole month of every weekend in the month of October. Right. So it depends on if it's a four week weekend to or a eight five to ten, weekend. Eight to ten events a year. Um, we would also have to look into what the noise ordinance was in the county prior to them coming into the city. Um, and we would run a risk of what happened at the drag strip, which was we show up, we write them a ticket for $100, then they operate with impunity and pay their $100 a weekend. Um, there, there are some opportunities to um, tighten up our noise ordinance, some, um, but if we want to go down that road, I'd like some direction from the commission on what weaknesses they see and, and what, <clears throat> what items we're trying to alleviate so that we can kind of tailor in that direction. I had my annual phone call, weekly phone call mm -hmm. today. I thought I'd gotten away <clears throat> from it, but... Um, I guess this Saturday night, they started two hours earlier than they normally did. Um, but, uh, and there was a lot of fireworks being shot off during the time. Um, they, the individual I was speaking with, didn't know if it was other residents around there that were trying to retaliate because they were so tired of the noise. But um, a question that I have is, do they have to get a permit to have that every year? Since that is a business, do they have a continual permit or is it something that they have to renew every October? They're supposed to have a business license, but they don't. The police asked me about them when all this came up. We looked into it and they do not have one, so we let the police know. Normally the police would approach them about that. And normally they would come in and get a business license, but they don't have one in the county or with us. Mayor, I do have a question uh, kind of related to that. Do And I can find out here, do we know what the property is zoned where this activity takes place? Is it agriculturally zoned? I don't know. I would, I would expect it to be, but I don't know for sure. I don't it, know the yeah. address. It's located on McDonald Road. Okay. I, I think I may have looked this up before, but I've, forgotten what we we uncovered i can look at it here and then let you all know afterwards um I, my advice is just and sam isn't here but he would probably i would think just uh urge you all to proceed cautiously because of the uh, uh the tennessee's very uh broad agricultural uh i guess uh, protection um laws don't we allow helicopter rides as an agricultural activity in the state of tennessee the state allows that and therefore we allow that. Okay. So um, recreational activities related to that and that's a matter of interpretation, but I'm just knowing if it is a, an agricultural zone, um, that we, we probably should investigate that fully. Okay. Will you do that for us? <clears throat> I mean, I, I live for 14 years about 200 yards from this facility mm -hmm. and I, every year, we knew what was coming. Um, <clears throat> it, it's all about how you choose to react. I understand that because it it would get rowdy. <clears throat> um, but to us, it became sort of like a railroad, living on a railroad track. After the first week and a half or two, <clears throat> we just didn't even notice it, even though it was really carrying on. Um, but it was someone doing something special for the community. They're trying to make a living. People thought enough of it to go out there and keep coming back. I think the positives are huge. There is, There are people who are uh, 
aggravated about this. And I don't know them. I don't want to know who they are because I think some people like to be aggravated about some things. And I would agree with <clears throat> Kelly that uh, caution would be very good, especially with the low density out there. The first, the first house on McDonald Road, either direction, it's not a long ways away, but it's not like it is in subdivisions for sure. So uh, I, I can understand the challenge, but I think the time of year and what's going on and why they're going about it is creates an awful lot of goodwill in our community as well. We're going out to college Dale, to have some fun, and I, I, I kind of appreciate that as well. But I just feel well, like I, that if we're going to keep our <clears throat> parks at 7 o'clock, why are we not treating the whole city area the same, the same way? I mean, if Greenbrier Cove can complain about the noise that comes out of the pickleball court and we say, okay, you can't have any activities out there after <clears throat> 10 o'clock at night, the people who live out there that also use our pickleball courts and know they can't come in and play after 10 o'clock, they're wondering why we aren't responding to their part of town. And I think that that's something we have to explain to them. I think the difference is the pickleball courts are, are city owned and operated facilities well, versus a privately operating enterprise. Does that mean then that if somebody in my neighborhood, uh, they even lived there before it was um, <clears throat> incorporated or annexed in? I mean, I've lived there for 50 years now. Does that mean that people in my neighborhood can just do what they want to do because they were doing it prior to being part of the city? If they've done it consistently the entire time, they would be existing nonconforming. I just, I just don't understand uh, why we can't get them to, to cooperate and keep the noise down enough that it's not bothering their neighborhood. So if I heard you correctly, the complaint started coming in after we changed the hours of the pickleball court. The complaints about this barn? Uh -huh. Oh, heavens, no. I've heard it every year I've been mayor. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a long term. It, it's been long term, and these people have lived out there for a long time. It's not that someone that has just moved into the neighborhood and is complaining. I... I mean, I've heard about the pickleball thing for a number of times now. And I, I must have been absent. I didn't know when we changed that or put a curfew on the pickleball courts at whatever time we did that. Um, and that seems to, little, to be a little extreme to me. To be, to we be turned the lights honest off. With you, what? We turned all the lights off. Well, it's just, that's the same. You're, they're closed down for right. whatever, but... Um, yeah, I. Some people can't plainly get off the late shift, and so I. I'm a, I'm amazed that they can hear the pickleball courts over at Greenbrier. Me, me too. I'm I'm here to tell you, I think there's somebody out there, uh, well enough about it. <laughs> anyway. The pickleball court hours were done in conjunction with the dog park hours and that that sort of thing. Okay. Um, the the lit facilities. We we turn the lights off at ten. The greenway itself is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because it's and then the playgrounds are are sun up to sundown. It all makes sense. I mean, <clears throat> accommodation has always been one of the things that I've, but it needs to be about common sense as well. And I understand. <clears throat> I understand the people's frustration. Um, but I also understand the business part of it for someone trying to make a living during one month of the year. So I, I don't know. I don't, I don't believe it like it is. Um, my problem would be that it was operating before the city annexed it, and I don't think we should punish the property owners. Um, the pickleball courts are under our jurisdiction, and government shouldn't. <clears throat> 
I already have pain when government tries to tell property owners what they can and can't do with their property. Um, but uh, that's my stance is property rights supersede um, government intrusion as much as possible. The subject property does appear to be zoned agricultural AG. So for to allow agricultural activities, you know, to the extent those take place on that property or not for, for, I guess, us to decide right now, but uh, just that's point of information. Thank you. And, and I would say on the other side of the coin that what happens on the piece of property that goes beyond the boundary of that property then becomes somebody else's problem as well. So it's not just confined to the acreage that they own, um, as everyone, I think, would agree, but still it initiates there. And so I guess that's... I tend to agree with Ethan's comment. I mean, the church just had a, a big fall festival out in that area, and it was probably loud at times. Um, I, I just don't want us to get into micromanaging and telling property owners what they can do in, in those kind of areas where it's agriculture. Um, I just, I don't, I, I've been out of high school for 13 years, 15 years, and it was going on out there before I before I was even in high school. It's been going on for over over twenty five years, I know. So it's it's mostly just for the month of October. Yeah. Just, just like most places have haunted houses and corn mazes and everything, which brings in I don't know, it brings in revenue for them, but it brings in where a lot of people do come in and they actually look forward to those activities, you know, during the fall. I c I kinda um I kinda see both ways, but I'm kind of in agreement with y'all that it was there. And it's not that I'm, I'm being in concern of the, the, the surrounding people, but I have a lot of things that go around my house that I just, you know, with the churches, they do things around me that kind of get loud at times. I understand that it's just, you know, uh, a moment, a short piece of time, you know, that it's going to occur. I am concerned too why we, with the pickleball court it closing at seven because a lot of people don't get off from work at five. They, they close at ten. Pardon? Ten. What was ten. the seven? I didn't say seven. I, th I heard seven. Okay, I'm gonna blame that on my medication. <laughs> okay. Pickleball court and, and dog park close at ten. Okay. And that's heard, when we shut the lights off. Yeah, that's why I was asking about seven because I, I heard the <clears throat> the time seven for some reason. I mean, a good example of of the county doing the way county does things. The Chattanooga Gun Rifle Club off Hunter Road. Uh, it gets loud over there yes. um, and very annoying. <clears throat> well, and, and discharging a firearm in the county is very legal, and the county properties is two doors down. So, um, Our church had their, their um, trunk and treat yesterday, which we had music going on and loud music and stuff in the air, which <clears throat> normally is not that loud, you know, but it was a, a just the kind of a special occasion. And I, I think that we – I, I kind of worry about – Okay, if we, we do this because we know they're in the county and everything, then next year, who do we take away? When do we complain? Do we, we do something? We, we, I know we have to look at everybody's rights and consideration, but I think overall, <clears throat> I think it's kind of grandfathered in. It, it was they, They've been doing it for all these years. I was woken up last night, probably after midnight, by an airplane coming and going out of the airport. Um, it threw me off because it was really late, and it's not normally that late. <clears throat> but, I mean, should we shut down the airport? At ten o'clock. <laughs> well, that's not. It did wake me up. Happens every night for four or five hours. Yeah. On during one month's time. How, how late do they stay open? When are they? They're open? supposed to close at eleven, but they usually stay open to past midnight. Sometimes till Probably one. Closer to the left of midnight. But do they post their hours as to what time they close? I haven't been out there. I don't. They know. they probably don't let people in maybe after eleven, but it takes them <laughs> to go through it. Right. Yeah. The thing, the thing I found was interesting is for years, I'd, I'd go by there, and they, I forget what kind of vehicle it was, sheriff or police, but they had officers out well, there directing traffic and involved in making time. sure that it didn't get out of hand and there wasn't other issues like drinking and stuff. And it was very well organized and controlled from that perspective, so I don't know if that's still going. But I so that was my next question and comment was, there was a time where College Hill officers were... <clears throat> being able to be hired for extra jobs there and then uh, was stopped um, by the previous, I don't know, police chief or whatnot. So is that something that could maybe 
help out over there, putting some officers over there that can be, because I know our guys love to get extra jobs because that's an extra, uh, the going rate, 150 bucks a night for them. Um, we can look into that. Um, or why that policy had stopped. <laughs> that wouldn't help, Actually, the, it's that wouldn't help the noise at all. Right now. But it would, I mean, I felt better when I saw a police car there because I knew it wasn't going to get into things that, might actually spill over into my property, which wasn't that far away. So um, it gave me a level of confidence that wasn't related to noise, though. And, and it might help the property owners out as well for traffic control and <clears throat> and parking. And I, I just remember whenever I first on the commission, a lot of the officers enjoyed working that event, and then it was abruptly stopped. So um, that might be a good compromise. I, currently, we're not working it. Right. But I can talk to the police chief about it and see if, if there's an interest in doing so and talk to Sam and see if there's any liability in us doing so. So like Sunday, they were just on overtime for the city if they worked out here? Or Ty were they typically on? the they, property they, owner pays. Yeah. No, the what? The property owner pays. So the Apple Festival, the festival paid for the officers. But they were working for the city? No, they, they were working under. So we do let them work out now and get paid. So right. that, that policy has been changed. Correct. It's okay. something when they, they work was, church. But they weren't doing it anymore. For the haunted house. They're not working the haunted house. Oh, okay. The haunted house. When is it uh, in? No when are they planning that? Oh, you said for the month of October. This weekend. This weekend. I mean, it's almost over. Yes. Okay. So we're basically going to be looking at for next year. Well, I've heard about it for the last three years. Yeah, what? I know. We've, we've and and it won't go away. Do you not take one of those the soccer things you were getting? Our our ordinance doesn't address decibels. We would have to update the ordinance first based on what decibels at what range. Okay. Um, and we would need to do a fair amount of legal research <clears throat> to at time of annexation what the county's ordinance was. Because if the county's ordinance didn't address decibels, we we can't since they've operated continuously by <clears throat> Can we not do some like you said, research and, and see? Because I'd like to know exactly how loud it is and how it. I'll just have to drive out there. Okay. I'll just have to drive out there and see. Anyway, I brought the issue, and I, I, I just think we need to make sure that they fit it. They keep within our our ordinances, whether they were there before or not. I think if they're in our city, that. They should comply to what our ordinances are. That's have my opinion. Over the years? Have they gotten louder over the years? Uh, this individual <laughs> believes they have because she thinks they probably have <clears throat> newer equipment, yeah. <clears throat> which is, you know, stronger. And I was going to add in with the numbers of people. Yeah, you know, if that's if that's an issue. They're not much barking. <laughs> But I do think they need to get permit to have a business in our in our community. Yeah, they're two separate issues, and we'll, we'll address them as such. I would agree with permitting. Yeah. Okay. Well, those were the only two things we had on the agenda. So, Eric, <coughs> Kelly, um, I think I mentioned it this morning, but I think Christina is here, so our award-winning parks supervisor. Congrats. So, thank you. <laughs> Go. Andrew? I uh, just wanted to inform the commission we had a chance, I had a chance to sit down with Jeremy and Laura, and we kind of collaborated. Laura had an idea of a courtesy tag being implemented. I wasn't real hip on that, but as we continued our dialogue, we are now going to not use our violation tag anymore and in place use a courtesy notice. It's basically doing the same thing, but the wording is different. Uh, we evaluated ever since the pandemic. I feel like people are a lot more on edge. And I think having the soft words of a courtesy notice versus violation tag will be a tremendous <laughs> benefit to us as we move forward doing codes enforcement where people won't be as irate, hopefully, and it'll be a little bit softer ended approach, hopefully yielding the same results. So just wanted to kind of give you guys an update and let you know about that. I like that. Yeah. That's Ed all. Educators do that for years. You say something good, you hit them with bad, you come back with something good. You know, I mean, it's it, actually it's good diplomacy. Mm -hmm. the yeah, and we were going to have the courtesy notice followed up with a violation tag, yeah. but as we talked more, I just thought that's just going to prolong the process, and I feel like this will be a real 
effective way to uh, yield <clears throat> positive results. So we'll see. That's all. Chris? Uh, hopefully pretty soon we've got another grant coming. Uh, this will be for uh, easement acquisitions. Um, so we're, I'm expecting that any day now. So probably in November we'll look at having that for you guys. Um, and then we've got some repairs coming to the weather station pretty soon that we have out there. So that's, that's it. Christina? Um, always lots of stuff going on with Parks and Rec. Um, but I do want to mention that tomorrow evening um, we are partnering with the library and helping them put on their annual escape room event. I think there's a few more spots available um, on that. And... Um, we are doing tree planting from the grants that we have coming in. Um, so if anybody has some extra muscle um, and wants to help us out on November 6th, um, we'll start planting those um, starting probably about 10 a.m. Um, we're also doing a planting, hopefully this week, um, with the homeschool, um, homeschool kids uh, using some trees that were donated from uh, the College Hill Tomorrow Foundation. Um, and we have lots of lots of stuff going on. A lot of our stuff is getting sold out, um, which is awesome. Um, that means we're doing something right. Um, we do have folks that are complaining about it, but um, <laughs> you're a victim of your success. Where, yeah, yeah, exactly. We are only two people, um, so it's hard to do um, huge, huge events um, and keep everybody safe. So, um, if you guys have anybody that wants to volunteer. Um, as well, we will gladly take volunteers, but um, everything seems to be going really, really well. And um, just to go off of what Kelly said, um, I actually got the um, TRPA Young Professional <coughs> Award uh, this past week at the conference, as well as turning over my presidency. So I gave the gavel away so now I can um, focus a little bit more on, on just this work instead of statewide stuff. So awesome. thank you. Glad we have you here. <laughs> uh, we are having the coalition's uh, legislative luncheon on November the 10th. <coughs> Diane has uh, been gracious enough to offer to host it. So we'll be having it over at Chestnut Hall. Um, if you have any legislative topics, top of mind, that you would like for us to bring to our legislators, please let Wayne or myself know or Mayor Lamb. <clears throat> we'll be glad to give you a report um, as to how that meeting goes with you. Michelle? I don't have anything tonight. On Wednesday, we have the presentation from UT for the Greenway Trees. Uh, it's at noon? Noon. Noon at Chestnut Hall. So if you have a chance, you can come out for that. So, um, but otherwise, what do y'all have? Ethan? Nothing tonight. Dr. Garber? <laughs> I, I guess the tree planting is someone had mentioned Veterans Day meeting happened when we're still doing that. Yes, that's okay. Fine. Yep. Okay. Thanks. So that'll that'll be November 11th. <coughs> um, following the program um, for the Veterans right. Day, we're going to plant 11 trees on November 11th for remembrance of the vets. And we're changing the time to two <coughs> to, to accommodate some folks. So it'll be a two o'clock rain or shine. So looking forward to that. I think the tree thing will be fun too to get some veterans involved in that process. The the program starts at two. Yes. Okay. So I had three of them on my calendar. That's what it's always been, but uh, we haven't advertised anything yet, so it shouldn't be out there uh, at three is this year. You, you have your program ready, so I can get with you on that. No. <laughs> <laughs> But the program is ready, but I don't have it ready, okay. <laughs> if you understand. Yes, I'm trying to give credit for where credit goes. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Baker. Oh. Mayor Lamb. Well, I had another phone call this week, okay. back this morning, about the parking from the festivals. Mm -hmm. um, the parking spilled over up into the community, Cosdale Community Church parking lot. Uh, if they parked all over their grass and so forth, they did some damage there, lots of trash. Um, they, uh, there, when church was out, they could not get out 
down onto Swinyard. There was an officer directing traffic. There was, but it also took some of them an hour to get out of the church parking lot. And um, they were not too pleased with that. Um, their suggestion is that to have someone at uh, the corner of Swinyard so they could stop and let their traffic on out, and then the people can come up and park in their <clears> lot, <throat> you know, for the afternoon and anything, anytime they want. If they just would keep them out during the, the church hours so that they don't have some issues like that. Um, they don't, I did not hear from it is written uh, area, but um, they evidently had some of the same issues of them parking up there and doing. Uh, I understand some damage to their uh, grassy areas and so forth, too. Um, so I just want to bring that to you. I know that that was an issue when they had uh, it a couple of weeks ago as well with all the parking. And so um, I told pa Pastor Arnold that I would bring it to the group today and let the city manager decide what they were going to do about it. We're going to build a parking lot across the street, 90 spaces on the street. And, uh, <laughs> we'll work with uh, Shannon and the police department on directing traffic a little tighter. I told them that we were working toward getting a parking area that would uh, accommodate the cars where they no longer could park, where they're developing the new park there that took away our parking space. I'll say that there was a very nice article in the newspaper today <clears throat> about it. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that that I, I know parking was an issue, but I, I came out both days to just to observe and to walk and everything. And uh, I think they ran out of apples pretty quick. I think I didn't by, see very many. they brought in a truckload, a panel truckload of apples. I think on Saturday they sold out about two o'clock. Well, it went fast. I, I, I saw them on Saturday, some, and then when I came that afternoon, Friday night a little bit, but. Um, I think it was an excellent turnout. Well, it was also unfortunate that they decided to tear out all the areas for the on-street parking <clears throat> three days before the event because that we didn't have any ability to get people into that four acres that we've got set aside for parking from Swinier. They had to turn in to the church road and then across traffic to get into that parking lot. So that problem should be solved if they'll get the on-street parking done, then we can go around them and use that lot without having them come in on the church side. That's where the big perfluffo really started. It is written, and I talked to them, what we're gonna do is we're buying about 150 um, T-bar posts. So for the big Christmas event and for anything else, we're gonna go up <coughs> and tape off the grass and do that it is written the only damage they had some guy decided to park in their grass and as he was backing out it looked like he spun out a tiny bit mm. but we went up and sort of blew it out and it vanished so um and then we sent our kids up and picked up garbage today i mean from in fact found a purse that got turned in down at city hall May I make one suggestion? And, and I noticed this just walking the area and then walking back as I parked over here. There was a lot of, of um, I want to say disabled, and elderly and so forth, but canes and, and wheelchairs and things, especially the people that were having to use canes. It was a long haul for them. So it's possible maybe to have shuttles. That's That was the other thing we talked about. Shannon is working with Udwa Middle mm -hmm. to, since their lots are all paved, basically put it on the advertising to park at Udawa Middle for $5 and then have a shuttle to bus them over and drop them. That way we could take our lot and have it just for handicapped and elderly people. <laughs> yeah. We handicapped could just have a sign that said, you know, without a handicap placard, you can't park in the, at the college. I just overheard people talking as they were walking by and everything and just listening. And then I noticed several, uh, it, there was quite a few. No, I was I was surprised, and I would use I would go as far as impressed how many people who were in wheelchairs and were disabled 
got out and enjoyed the, the day. They did. I was also really happy that, you know, we had been told for years that we had to have alcohol, we had to have alcohol, you know, without alcohol, you weren't going to get a crowd, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we probably had close to 20,000 people come through, no beer sales, no nothing. I mean, it was just all family friendly. It's just, we sort of had a weird confluence of events that made it. PNC starting on the road parking, no football game in the afternoon. <clears throat> so everybody was there in the afternoon and the weather was perfect. And it just, and there was absolutely evidently nothing going on in Hamilton County except our Apple Festival. It so, was well advertised. Yeah, it was well advertised. And, but as I said, we are working on um, the middle school, setting it up to where people can park up there. And I said, we're then buying the T bars to do what Eric does at 4th of July and just tape areas off. Yeah. Well, Pastor Arnold uh, said that, you know, outside of the Saturday morning time, people were welcome to park. Right. There I mean, yeah, their I've talked to lots. Jerry about it. And, yeah. and as I said, it just that trying to turn people into that parking lot across them trying to get out. That's where it was becoming <clears throat> a, a mess. And that should be fixed. I talked to PNC and they promised they're going to get that on street parking if not paved, they're going to have it graveled pretty quick. It may, that should help. Just just popped in my head. Uh, we've had a lot of parking in front of the Veterans Park. There's a big field there that's not very far away. If someone directed traffic or they had rows of tape or something where they, you know, got in and got out without just driving wherever they wanted to and park, that might be an option to look at anyway. I mean, if it hasn't rained a lot, uh, that would be one issue. But well, we were going to park. We were going to park all the vendors in the lower field. I mean, we had it taped off. We had it all ready, and then mm -hmm. Thursday night, about nine o'clock, it dropped two inches of rain on yeah. top of the commons, and that yeah. the trailers that were already down there, it practically took a bulldozer to get them out. So we're even talking about doing some sort of little loop down there, not for parking, but just so we could drive people down there. Down where was that? Down behind the commons in the lower oh, field. Okay. Great. So great. So we're working on it. We and you know, same with the loud music. We're buying the decibel reader, and we're going to do a test concert in November, and where I can have someone in the building, and I can go over to, you know, outside of the commons grounds, and okay, I can hear it. You know, I've met with the neighbors over in Glen Downing, and so we're working on that. I mean, you can't anticipate all the problems. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing is everybody here is willing to work towards it when they do come up. And I think you can't ask any more than that, David. So way to go. Well, thank you. We're trying. I have a couple of thank yous. Okay. Eric, thank you I uh, for fixing the school light. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had a couple of people text me about it and a couple of parents and they were concerned that that light was not flashing and they couldn't believe it got fixed so quickly and they, they texted me back, thank you, so I'm going to pass that on to you. Also to Andrew, to tell Jamie thank you for getting the grass cut and getting in contact with that owner over on Udwa Ringo Road. And I was going to congratulate Christina, but we've done that already. Um, for those of you that may not take the Chattanooga Times Free Press <clears throat> home delivery, they're going to quit delivering it. They're going to quit printing a daily paper. And uh, so I wondered how that would affect our announcements, because aren't they required to be in the newspaper? They are, but I believe the digital will would take care of that. Okay, I think so. But Chrissy's checking with Sam to make sure. Okay, that was my concern on that. The TML conference for next uh, year is going to be August 13 through 15 in Gatlinburg. So put that on your calendar. And um, I have a suggestion when there's new 
businesses in town, why don't you let the commissioners know? I noticed there's there's two at least two new businesses in town. There's a new antique shop on Main Street, if you guys didn't know that already. I just noticed it this week. Um, it's where the, uh, it's next to the little barbecue place right there on Main, that where it used to be, oh, I forgot the gentleman's name. It used to be a motorcycle shop. Yeah, the motorcycle shop. That's now an antique show, uh, shop and stuff. Very nice, isn't it? Yeah. Very. Go in there and check it out. I wondered what they were doing in there. Yeah. And I have a concern about the skateboards around Southern. On two different occasions, I've noticed them coming down White Oak Drive out and making a big circle right out onto University. And one kid lost it and hit flat on his face. And if there'd been cars coming, we would have had some real, real issues of injury there. And so I don't know if there's some way maybe the you or the police chief or somebody could uh, caution uh, the student um, vice president for students there to mm -hmm. suggest them to those kids because we've had the student killed over there. We'll reach out years ago. do what we can. Uh, from previous conversations, the skateboarders are, um, I want to say reckless, but reckless. Oh, they and, are. Um, and they and it's, it's an ongoing problem that they face on the campus, yeah. and it seems like every time they come up with a way to address it, they find a way to do something else reckless. But we'll reach out and see if we can. <laughs> well, when they're zigzagging down, right down the University Drive, it just scares me to death. Because I was before I was while I was still working over there, they had a student killed. Um, a being car hit him. He was being towed by a car. He was being towed by a car, and <laughs> yeah. But the the one thing, a lot of the ones around here, they're a lot of them are students in Southern, but a lot of them aren't. So it's certainly not a Southern problem only. Uh, well, the, these were students you know, that I saw. Yeah, the community but, uh, has. Several other young people like to. Yeah. That's why we need a skateboard park. Come on, folks. Yeah. That would be nice. We'll see what we can do. These kids deserve a place to go. Oh, I, I agree with that, but just don't do it out in the street. Yes, ma'am. That's something okay. we need to look at, though, is doing the skate That's park. all. Okay. Well, I, well, I, I did know, have. Was that enough? I had one last thing. Uh, we're in the midst of the, the uh, deck the hall photo contest where we've invited members of the community to submit their images, uh, photographs around the city um, for consideration for an award. There will be an award for the top three, but those that are chosen would be um, used to decorate City Hall as we kind of embark on our redecoration efforts in City Hall. Mm -hmm. So one of the best ways that we thought was have the citizens submit their best pictures. Just wanted to get that word out there to let you all know about that. So is, it, is there a deadline? Or there's nothing out there to shoot pictures of right now, is there? For Christmas? Well, we had the Apple Festival. We had oh, their skateboarders out there. Deck the hall sound like Christmas to me. So I, <laughs> Leaves are changing. Yeah, deck the hall meaning fill up some of these bare walls in, in the oh, city hall. Okay. I so, yeah, no, no limitation oh, on the season of the, oh, okay. the picture. Yeah. So, yeah, anything that's in, in the city, this area that – you know, White Oak or whatever, I'm not going to put that up. And then we'll have a panel that judges those and then select the top three who win a, uh, an award for that. Actually, I think it's a gift card is what we've, uh, we're going to offer the, the top three. And then the rest uh, will be honorable mentions, and they are honored by having their pictures that they've taken and submitted, uh, framed and hung in City Hall. You're the, photo, you're the photo class at Southern. They'd love to get involved in that thing. Yeah, and we actually have um, our new teen services uh, person over at the library, Nick, is going to be doing a photography program as well to try to get some teens out there. Um, but even though we have asked for photos, um, it's any medium that, you know, if you want to paint Betts Park or something like that, we're taking those as well as um, a regular photograph. Are we going to have a Christmas parade this year? No. No? We're doing the tractor swing. Tractor swing. There will be no more parade.
decorate. No more Christmas. Okay, that, that was we, a question. We I are got. starting a new. Uh, as of last year, we okay. were starting the new tradition of doing the tractor swing. Um, it's a lot easier to to maintain everybody in one location, um, and we don't have to shut down roads and have businesses upset of the road being walked off and stuff yep. too. So. I think we can make it just as great as the parade has been in the past. Yep. Nothing else? No, it was just a question I received and I just remembered it. We're adjourned. <laughs>